Testing. Mic check. One, two.
Well, good evening. I want to welcome all of you to our midweek service. If you would stand with us tonight, we'll open up our service this evening in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. As always, Holy Spirit, we need your help. We pray for wisdom and guidance. Lord, that you would be with Trevor and the youth group and Michelle and our kids. We want to glorify you in your house this evening. So Jesus, have your way. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated with us tonight. As you can see, there's some construction going on in the lobby. And we want to thank uh, Greg and Jerome Versweibel, all those who uh, were able to come and work the past couple days. They did find the leak. And hopefully uh, it is a permanent fix, so uh, we are thankful for that and getting things put back together real soon. Uh, and don't forget, next week, uh, Monday, we have our young adult Bible study. Uh, actually, uh, Brother Trevor is going to come, and we're going to have a little worship night with the young adults. Uh, and any of y'all who consider yourself to be a young adult can come join us if you want. Uh, but that'll be this coming Monday at 6.30 or 7 o'clock. We usually will get started. Now let's... Uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, need to pray uh, for Brother Sam. He is having some improvements um, uh, with his wound vac, so we are so thankful for that. Need to continue to ask uh, God's favor for him. Uh, Sister Miranda talked to her this afternoon. All went well, and she didn't. Uh, they supposedly were going to have to put stitches in a rotator cup, but they didn't even have to do that. Uh, so uh, all went well for her. Just continue to pray. Uh, for a complete recovery for her. Continue to pray for Brother Charles Manuel with his wound vac on his foot and also Brother Martin, Sister Martin as well. And pray uh, for Brother Cecil and all those who are uh, battling cancer. Are there any other prayer requests here tonight, Mom? Okay. Okay. Yes, Jude? Okay. Pray for your uncle tonight. Yes, Sister Greta? Unspoken? Yes, sir. Unspoken as well? Okay. So, Sarah. Man, man, pray for them. Any other prayer requests tonight? Yes, Sister Lenora? Okay. Myers family. And uh, continue to pray. Uh, Sister Kaylin, she's recovering from her procedure as well, her knee replacement. If you would stand with us this evening, we'll take these knees to the Lord. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, tonight we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Lord, we ask that you would bless all these requests as we intercede on behalf of all of them. Lord, I'm so thankful for blessing, for you blessing Sister Miranda with a successful shoulder surgery. And we, Lord, we pray for a speedy recovery for her. Lord, that you would restore function for her in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Brother Sam, Sister Barbara. Uh, Lord, that you would continue to minister to them. Lord, we ask that you continue to heal uh, Brother Sam's leg. Lord, we lift up Brother Charles Manuel tonight. Lord, we pray for healing for his foot, this wound vac. Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen him. Lord, bless him. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for Brother Martin. And like I mentioned, it was so good to see him this past Sunday morning. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that your favor would fall upon him. Lord, that you would strengthen him. Be with Sister Martin as well. Lord, tonight we lift up all those who are battling cancer. Lord, we pray for Cecil Martin. Uh, Lord, we pray for Miranda's father-in-law, Mr. Keith Fark. Lord, we lift him up to you. Uh, Uncle Gorner, and, and he is in need of a blood transfusion. Our cousin Blaine. Uh, Lord, he's dealing with some symptoms. Lord, we just pray that you would bless him and continue to strengthen all those who are battling cancer tonight. And Lord, we ask that you would bless their families tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, uh, we ask that uh, you would continue to minister to all those who are sick. Lord, we pray your healing touch for all those who need healing in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would bless Jude's uncle, Lord. All, again, all those who are battling cancer, Lord, that you would strengthen them. Um, and Lord, as Sister Sarah mentioned, uh, Lord, we just pray for those who, who work outside uh, as we come into the, 
the spring and summer months, Lord, we just pray for those who work out in the heat, Lord, that you would keep them safe. And Lord, we lift up all those who have to work and, 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 and aren't able to, to come to church because of, of working hours. Lord, we just pray for them, Lord, that you would provide for them in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask tonight that you would minister to all of the unspoken prayer requests. Jesus, you are our high priest. You know our needs. You understand the burdens we have tonight. And Lord, we pray your will be done in our lives. Lord, we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for protection for those who are fighting, for those who are in harm's way. Lord, that you would minister to them tonight, Lord. And we pray that the name of Jesus would be glorified in this situation. Lord, uh, as we always do, we lift up our lost loved ones. Lord, we pray for them. Holy Spirit, lift them up. Soften their hearts that they may receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And Lord, as always, Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. Have your way in our service tonight, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We can have an usher come tonight. If you would bow your heads, we'll pray over the offering. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you tonight for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for uh, allowing these work crews to find the issues. And Lord, we thank you for our wonderful facilities that we have here. Uh, and Lord, we just pray your protection over it as we go throughout this hurricane season. And, and that goes for everyone's home and property. Lord, we just ask for a hedge of protection this summer. Lord, we ask that you would bless this congregation. Lord, I thank you for those who are faithful those who continue to give and sacrifice and serve and pray and, and, and serve this church in a variety of different ways. Lord, I thank you for the leadership that we have in this church. Lord, I pray your wisdom for them. Lord, we ask that you would bless this offering tonight. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Tonight, if you would, you can join with me in John chapter 20. Uh, we have been discussing uh, the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. And we looked at the Emmaus Road, and we looked at Jesus appearing to the disciples with and without Thomas, and and tonight we're going to go back a little bit in John chapter 20 and, and we're going to look as he appears or shows himself to Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20. And just for the context, even though it is not Easter Sunday, we're going to go back and look at the context and we're going to read verses 1 through 18 here in John chapter 20. And I promise you, I'll have you out in about two hours and we'll be on our way, Brother Rod. <laughs> You'll be out before then. <laughs> Just have supper ready for me, please, sir. In John chapter 20, join with me in verse 1. It says, Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved. And said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter therefore went out, the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciples who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know that the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. 
Verse 11, but Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping and she wept. She stood down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbani, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. A dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And Father, I'm so thankful that today we celebrate a risen Savior. Jesus, you are our Lord and Savior, and you are sitting at the right hand of the Father. And our hope is not only in your resurrection, but also in our resurrection. That we too will join you in the clouds in heaven for eternity. And Lord, as we see throughout your post resurrection appearances your disciples struggled to to recognize you and Lord it's so scary to understand that sometimes you can be so close and yet we can't see so Holy Spirit we pray Lord remove the flesh that bind, blinds us allow us to walk in the spirit Lord we thank you for it we ask it all in Jesus name amen so tonight, as mentioned, we're looking at the first, what most scholars believe, and I agree tonight, the first post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. And you'll find it, some find it ironic, but Jesus in his perfect way chose to reveal himself to Mary Magdalene. And there's some significance in that detail alone. But well, let's get to it. First, let's look at the first uh, 10 verses as we talk about the empty tomb. In John chapter 20, which you can also find parallels in Matthew 28, Mark 16, and Luke 24. It says, On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went into the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So the first day of the week... Uh, in the Jewish week is obviously Sunday, and you will find this consistent with all of the Gospels. They're all the same. And I know there's some disagreements as to whether Jesus was crucified on a Thursday or a Friday, and, and how do you fit uh, three days and three nights? But it is consistently understood from Scripture, as Scripture is always consistent, that Jesus here was resurrected on Sunday morning. And Mary... Magdalene went to the tomb early. We see it was still dark as John reveals these details. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, before we go any further, let's just kind of build the context to understand who Mary Magdalene is. Because there are several Marys in the Bible, right? The mother of Jesus. Uh, we have uh, several different Marys that you, you'll see, and, and it can be confusing. And, and we don't know a whole lot about Mary Magdalene, but we do understand from her title that she came from the town of Magdala, which is on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. Scripture also tells us about Mary Magdalene in, in Mark chapter 16, also in Luke chapter 8, I believe. But in Mark 16, 9, we see this detail about her. It says, now when he rose early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. So Mary Magdalene, as we all know, is a disciple of Christ. And her backstory is that she was from Magdala. 
And Magdala was a town known for its prostitution, and most people assume that she was a harlot. But by the time she comes in contact with Jesus, she is deep in sin and is being possessed by seven demons. And verse 9 here in Mark chapter 16 tells us that Jesus first appeared to her out of whom he had cast out seven demons. And Mary Magdalene had witnessed a lot of the events of Jesus' earthly mission, especially surrounding the crucifixion. She was present at the mock trial of Jesus. She heard Pontius Pilate pronounce the death sentence. She saw Jesus beaten, humiliated by the crowd. And she was probably one of the ones that stood near Jesus during the crucifixion to comfort him. And it says in verse 2 that she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So when she saw the empty tomb, her first reaction was to think like many other of the disciples thought that his body was stolen. Him being alive or resurrected was nowhere near on her thinking. She wasn't wishing or anticipating the resurrection of Jesus, but she did not imagine that he was alive, but more that somebody had stolen the body of Jesus. And it says, we do not know where they have laid him. See, the if you put the harmony of the Gospels together, this plural pronoun shows us that Mary wasn't by herself. We just see that Mary Magdalene was the one that chose to run back to the disciples, and that's why John mentions her. You see, other Gospels explain that there were other women that came there that morning. At least three other accompanied her by the scriptures that we can read. But again, because she was the one that ran back, John chose to use her. And I, and I put a little illustration in the PowerPoint where you can see the harmony of all four Gospels. If you notice, from Matthew all the way to John, you'll see Mary Magdalene up there. She is consistently mentioned in all four Gospels. In Matthew, you'll see the other Mary. And most people believe this to be Mary, the mother of James. You'll see Salome in Mark chapter 16. You'll see Joanna. And there are other women. But at least three, maybe even five or more, we don't know, were with Mary Magdalene that day. But again, as we look at John's account, because she went back, she was the one that was referenced here in this story. So Mary sees the empty tomb. She comes back, she runs to the disciples, and she again went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And we know from our study in John, when you see the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that is John humbly referencing himself in Scripture. And he'll, he'll lose his humility here in a second. But we see most of the time John doesn't mention himself by name other than the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it says in verse 3, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, that's himself, that's John, and were going to the tomb. And they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. So again, humility tells us that John doesn't use his name to reference himself, but he lacks humility when he lets the future world know that he's much faster than Peter, right? Apparently, Peter was 10 or 15 years older. That'd be like me and Brother Rod racing. I'd, he'd have no chance, right? And he says, maybe, maybe. But the story goes, John gets there first. And Peter is lagging behind. Again, verse 5, he... Stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. John is referencing himself. He peeked into the empty tomb. He looked in there and he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Uh, there are a lot of theories as to why John didn't go in. 
Maybe it was fear, shock. Uh, maybe he was expecting to see Jesus come out of there. There are all sorts of different theories, but we do understand as the story plays out, because John's talking about himself, that he did not go into the tomb. In verse 6, it says, Then Simon Peter came. He followed him. And this time, instead of stopping at the, at the entrance, notice that Peter went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. So whatever kept John from going in did not stop Peter. And this was, again, a custom to Peter's character. Peter was always quick to act, quick to think, quick to speak, and usually getting himself in trouble, but also many times proving himself to be the leaders of his fellow disciples. And in context with the following verse, it's almost as if Peter is likely speaking to John about what he sees. And there's a crucial detail in one of the cloth pieces. This was somehow identifiable as the one used specifically for the face of Jesus. And Peter notices that this handkerchief or this face cloth is not with the rest of the grave cloths. And John, as we'll see in verses 7 and 8, will come in for himself and, and again have this moment of realization. You see, Mary was the first person to see Jesus alive on Resurrection Sunday. John, however, was the first person to believe that Jesus was alive. And, and I'll show you that when we get there. But let's just stop here for a quick second and talk about this handkerchief, this face cloth, depending on your translation. Um, it was designated uh, for Jesus' face, and it was placed off to the side, away from the other burial cloths. And it wasn't casually thrown or crumpled either. Peter notices, as we go back and read, and he says, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. So there was something unique, something point to be referenced by this. Um, again, there were theories. I'm sure Mary Magdalene was probably assuming that someone, maybe even a grave robber, had stolen the body. But this detail of this handkerchief disproves this theory because who would take time to remove the grave cloth and take the face cloth and gently fold it off to the side if they were just trying to get in and get out as fast as you can? Again, this took time. And a common claim, which some of you, I know Brother Rod was telling me he heard in a message, um, that this involves a Jewish custom uh, in Jesus' era, according to uh, people see seated at dinner. They would signal to the servants using this cloth at dinner to fold it a certain way, and it meant that they were finished, or that they, would, uh, they enjoyed it and they were probably likely to return. And this is a popular idea and reference, and it most likely could be something that Jesus had intended to use. But whatever or however it was intended to be used, this folded face cloth, this handkerchief, changed John's life forever. It says, then the other disciple in verse 8, and we know that's John referencing himself. He came to, who came to the tomb first? Again, he wanted to let the world know that he's much faster than Peter. Went in also and saw and believed. You see, John perceived that the missing body and the position of the grave clothes was not due to robbery. He realized that very moment when he looked in, probably going off of what Peter told him, he wanted to see it for himself, that Jesus had risen from the dead. And he had, had physically or spiritually, in this case, went through the grave cloths. Again, he, he started to understand that the tomb was open not to let Jesus' body out, but to let the disciples and the world and us today realize that he was not there, that he was alive. And again, most scholars believe that the uniqueness in this folding of this handkerchief had led John to come to that assumption. But here in verse 8, we see that John 
was the first person to believe that Jesus was alive. Not having seen him, he's not the first person to see him, but because of what he saw, even though Peter saw it, and we don't know if Peter had believed that moment the same time as John, but we do see John writing about himself says he remembered looking in there and seeing, and for the first time he understood that Jesus was alive. Now, verse 9 gives us a crucial detail about what they were thinking. Again, John is writing this about himself. And he's really honest right here in verse 9. And he says, For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes. So this tells us that even though John believed that Jesus was alive, he didn't fully understand what Jesus' resurrection truly meant. In fact, it wasn't so life-changing. And what did they do? Him and Peter, they left Mary behind and they went home. So whether John was still trying to put these things together and looking at the evidence, we know that from this point on, the disciples usually gathered or huddled together in fear. So John knew Jesus was alive, but didn't understand the spiritual significance of what that truly meant. And how many of you know tonight, or you should know tonight, that for the Christian, serving a dead Jesus is serving a, a dead Jesus in vain? It means absolutely nothing for us. If Jesus isn't alive, we don't need to be here tonight. You can go follow any other religion that serves a dead God and not have to come and worship Jesus because the resurrection is our hope. It's our identity. It's who we are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But now let's get into, this is the actual sermon here I wanted to talk about tonight, starting in verse 11. And, and I always try to give you a parallel scripture. And in Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 11, there's a little bit, a couple of details about it, if you want to go look at that. But the main story here is in John chapter 20, verse 11. Okay, so again, understand the context. That's why we read verses 1 through 10. Mary went to the tomb. It's empty. She goes back and gets Peter and John. They come to the tomb. Peter goes in first. John goes in second. He sees it. He believes. They go home. Mary is still there. Could be surrounded by three, four, five other ladies, but John chose to reference Mary Magdalene, and I think he did so with a purpose. If you were on trial for your life and you needed an, a good witness, would you pick someone like Mary Magdalene to be your witness? Probably not. In fact, in Jewish culture, as sexist as it was, women didn't have a say in a courtroom. They had no validity. Couldn't be a witness. And here Jesus chose to use Mary Magdalene. Someone who was known maybe for prostitution, but also for being possessed by demons. Jesus reveals himself first to her. And I think that just flies in the face of the culture that were expecting him but missed it. Now, look with me in verse 11. Mary is standing outside the tomb and she's crying. Someone stole the body of Jesus and she wants to know where it is. And no doubt, after Peter and John did what they did, and she witnessed it, and they left, I'm sure her curiosity started to get to the best of her. And as she wept, she stood down and looked into the tomb for herself. And she saw two angels in verse 12 in white, and they were sitting, one at Jesus' head where it was lying, and the other at where his feet would be. And, and, and we notice that what she sees is not reference to what Peter and John see. There's no reference to, to burial cloths or a handkerchief. We see in verse 13 what she perceived. And what she perceived, what she saw was not there when Peter and John looked in. In fact, in verse 13 it says, 
in verse 12, it says there were two angels and then the angels speak to her. Woman, why are you weeping? They said. And she replies in verse 13, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the appearance of angels with people, what were their usual reaction to seeing a, an angel? They were scared out of their minds. Usually the angel had to say, hey, peace be with you. It's OK. Had to identify themselves because no doubt the presence of an angel just sparked fear. But we don't see that in Mary. In fact, Mary begins to say, hey, uh, what have you done? Where is the body of Jesus? Don't you know that the, Jesus was here? This is where they laid him and now he's not here. They have taken him, she says. And now in verse 14, we start to see Jesus begin to appear to Mary. It says, now when she said this, she turned around and you can almost picture your, herself backing out. She had to stoop down to look in. So she's starting to stand up and, and back up and turn around. And when she does this, she sees, well, she doesn't know it's Jesus, but she sees somebody behind her. John said it was Jesus. But John also tells us in the last part of verse 14 that she did not know that it was Jesus. Now, we have in our three or four occurrences that we've talked about, most of the time, the initial reaction of these disciples is to not recognize who Jesus is. The, the road to Emmaus, the two disciples... They walked with Jesus for hours and hours as he unfolded the Old Testament and they didn't know who they were talking to. The disciples in the room when Jesus appeared, they were scared out of their minds, right? They didn't recognize him. And why is this? Was there some sort of spiritual blinding so they didn't recognize him to learn and have faith? Maybe. Was his face disfigured? Was his appearance changed in his resurrected bodies? All could be plausible theories. But we do know Mary turned around in the face of Jesus and did not recognize him. In fact, she'll come to think that he was a gardener, right? Look in verse 15. So she turns around. She sees Jesus, doesn't know who it is. And Jesus says to Mary, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, says to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus speaks to her face. And in the face of Jesus, Mary supposes him to be a gardener, someone working at the cemetery. And Mary says nonchalantly, not recognizing who she's talking to, says, uh, sir, if you have carried him away, maybe you saw someone who carried him away since you work here. You're the gardener. Can you tell me who took him, where they put him? And I will take him. I'll put him back and we'll put him back the way he's supposed to be. So Jesus doesn't initially reveal himself to Mary. And this wasn't to play a trick on her. It was to break through her unbelief. And I think her unbelief was fueled by emotion and trauma and what had gone on that day. Can you imagine? She's probably a wreck. And for the moment, her thoughts are, as we've seen, consistently locked into the idea that Jesus wasn't alive. No, somebody, in fact, had taken the body of Jesus. She assumes that this person that's tending to the grave area may have done it or knows who did it. And essentially her response to Jesus is, I just want to know where the body is. Please tell me where Jesus is. And I think there's a very valuable lesson for us to understand in this illustration here. Is that we too need to only Focus on finding Jesus. There are a lot of things that religion tells you you have to do, but all they are become stumbling blocks. We need to put our focus and our minds and our hearts on Christ. 
and trust His will. And response to Mary calling Jesus the Son of God, her Lord and Savior, a gardener, He says Mary, her name. And she turned and said to Him, Rabbani, which is to say teacher. Jesus had to but say her name. And everything was understood. It may have been her name, the tone, the voice. It may have been a supernatural occurrence. But Mary knew and recognized who she was talking to. And calls him Rabbani. And it, John helps us with this Aramaic word. And it's teacher. She recognizes that Jesus is alive. Now, again, for us as Christians, we too should come to recognize the voice of Jesus. And it may not be an audible voice. It may be in our spirit. It may be something else that completely is uh, unrelated to, to verbal speech. But how many of you know, and Scripture teaches us, that we will recognize the voice of Jesus. We will hear the voice of our shepherd. And again, audible or not, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to recognize. In John chapter 10, verse 2, Jesus says this. He says, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And it is my testimony to you tonight. I heard the voice of Jesus a long time before I ever said yes to him. I knew it. I knew something was happening in my life. Maybe I didn't quite understand it. Maybe I wasn't mature enough to understand it but I knew there was something that I wasn't listening to. And that's what the Holy Spirit does to us. It may be through wisdom, through scripture, it may be through guidance, it may be through error and correction, but God will speak to us and we will recognize. You know, as a youth pastor for so many years, a lot of, uh, many youth members have always asked me the same question. How do I recognize the voice of God in my life? How do I know it's, the Holy Spirit talking to me and not the little me inside of me. Well, I can't tell you that you will completely recognize a certain voice from one or another, but I can tell you that if your spirit speaks to you and it honors God, that's God talking to you. If you hear a little voice inside your head telling you things that are contrary to the word, to the will of God, that's not God. God will never steer you or direct you into sin into things that are against His will for you. And again, it seems like we're waiting. Jesus, if you would just speak to me like I'm speaking to you right now, I will believe. But that's not how Jesus works. Jesus asks you to have faith. I mean, look at John. Did John see the body of Jesus? No. He saw grave cloths. He saw a folded handkerchief. And it says he believed. And here, Mary turns and says, Rabbani. Now again, what, how far does she understand the implications of a risen Jesus? We'll come to understand that with her. But let's close out the chapter here, or the verses here in verses 17 and 18. Jesus says to her, and talking to Mary Magdalene, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, there is some confusion as to what Jesus says and what it means. When Jesus says to Mary, do not cling to me, that doesn't mean that she can't touch him. But it does tell us that Jesus did not want her to cling, to stay, to keep, to remain clinging to him, but that she needed 
but that Jesus needed her to go tell the disciples what he had told her to tell her. So it wasn't that she couldn't touch her. It's that when she finally realized who she was talking to, she embraced Jesus with a bear hug and would not let him go. And Jesus says, Mary, I need you to go do something for me. I need you to go tell my brethren. And say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary does what she is told and tells the disciples that she came and seen the Lord and that she had spoken these things to her. Now, again, it is very interesting that Jesus made a woman the first witness of his resurrection, especially in the time in which Jesus lived in. Again, we know from a Jewish history that in the courts that women did not have a voice. But Jesus chose to reveal himself to Mary Magdalene. And I believe he's doing the exact same thing to everyone today. He continues to reveal himself in a different ways. To Mary Magdalene, it was face to face. But to John... It was a, a handkerchief. And scripture tells us that we can see Jesus in creation. We are without excuse to understand that there is a divine creator in the world in which we live in. Now again, I want to express how important it is that we too understand that Jesus is alive. Now, the disciples as we learn here tonight, didn't quite fully understand the significance of a risen Jesus, what that truly meant for them. And, and I want to read just one little verse and then we'll close in prayer. But it's something that we've talked about before. But I, I wanted to give you a little bit of encouragement. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and, and I didn't put this in the PowerPoint behind me, so you may need to go and look at it for yourself. But I want to read it for you. In, in my Bible, maybe you can pull out your Bible or on your phone or whatever you need to do. But in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul talks about how a risen Christ is our hope. In verses 12 through 19, Paul says this. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and if we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men of most pitiable. So if Jesus didn't, isn't alive, then all the vain efforts Paul is talking about. We have no hope. We have no hope of seeing our lost loved ones who have gone on to be with the Lord. We have no hope of ever seeing Jesus again. But in verse 20, and listen carefully. In verse 20, it says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also comes the resurrection of the dead. And you can go on and read some fantastic stuff there in chapter 15. But I need you to understand tonight that the resurrected Jesus is the crux of our faith. It's our hope. It's who we are. And we also need to believe and be comforted by this. If Jesus revealed himself to Mary Magdalene and to his other disciples, he's going to continue to reveal himself to the lost. Just as the Holy Spirit does with us. So when we pray for lost loved ones, we can have faith that God is still able. There's nothing impossible for him. If you would stand with me tonight. Again, I want to thank all of you uh, for your faithfulness. We'll continue on 
Lord willing, next Wednesday night to talk about uh, Jesus uh, feeding his disciples by the fire and the restoration of Peter. Uh, but don't forget, uh, we have service this Sunday morning at 10 and Sunday night at 6.30. If you would bow your heads, we'll dismiss the service in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful day. And Lord, we can only begin to try to imagine what Mary Magdalene saw that day. And Lord, to, to read that she was speaking to you and didn't recognize you. And then when you said her name, fear left, doubt left, and she believed. She recognized you for who you are. And what's fascinating is that you go on to tell her, to tell the rest of the disciples that I'm ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And what you say here in summary Jesus, is that you're telling your disciples that you are who you say you are. And you have accomplished what you said you were going to do. And today you're alive. You're our eternal high priest. You're sitting at the right hand of the Father this very moment. Lord, I thank you for what you did for us on Calvary. Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray if there's anything that keeps us from recognizing the presence of Jesus. You can have it. Take it away from us. Lord, there are some of us tonight that may be walking in the flesh. Help us to repent, to turn from that way, and to continue to be led and drawn by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you told Mary not to cling to you. You gave her a mission to go tell the disciples and Lord, we have that same mission today. We're not to hide you or to, to keep you in a closet or to keep you inside of a church building. No, we're to tell the world about you. To show the lost, the love and grace and mercy, Jesus, that you showed us. And Lord, we thank you for it. Be with us this evening as we leave your house. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Have a good night.